Welcome to ILTV's Israel Daily. I'm Natasha Kirchuk, and coming up in today's newscast, an 11-year-old girl becomes the youngest Israeli to fall seriously ill with the coronavirus. Isolation drives Israelis closer together, and Israeli Memorial Day begins at sundown. So stay tuned to see how you can participate this year. Well, we're finally waking up to some positive news today. Only 68 new cases of coronavirus have been confirmed in the last 24 hours, bringing the total number of Israelis with COVID-19 to 14,466 and counting. That's an increase of only 23 infected over the night before, which is a massive, massive drop. Right now, 129 people are in serious condition, down from 133 the night before. And 96 are on ventilators. 202 have passed away from COVID-19 in Israel, but luckily 6,796 Israelis have now recovered from the coronavirus. One case, however, is shaking up the country. An 11-year-old girl with COVID-19 has just been put on a ventilator, making her the youngest person in Israel to be in serious condition. The young girl is from Tiberias, and she was apparently brought to the hospital on Friday, vomiting with a high fever and a lack of appetite. Since then, her condition has reportedly worsened and her heart has been affected by complications with the virus. Now, before her case, the youngest person in Israel to require ventilation was 19 years old. Shocking case. Now, coronavirus regulations have gotten a bit confusing within the last 24 hours after the Israeli government seemingly couldn't figure out how far they're willing to allow locals to venture away from their homes. ILTV's Aaron Porras has the details. The cabinet has now approved that starting after Independence Day on Wednesday, the 500-meter limitation on the distance from home that Israelis can exercise will be lifted. In other words, locals will finally be able to run wherever they please. And there was initial confusion over this directive, though, after Public Security Minister Gilad Erdan tweeted that the limitation had been immediately removed. Under the current rules, Israelis are still required to remain within 100 meters of their homes unless they're going out for something essential like buying food, medicine, or seeking medical care. But police have admitted that enforcing such a rule is basically unfeasible. While as more regulations roll back, police will have a lot more work attempting to ensure that businesses comply to hygiene rules. And after Independence Day, gyms are also set to open. Bed and breakfasts will be permitted to reopen, along with some schools as well. So since Saturday night, stores that aren't in shopping malls are allowed to operate as long as they adhere to guidelines regarding cleanliness. <laughs> Now, many Israelis are just starting to regain some sense of normalcy, but not all businesses are celebrating the easing of coronavirus restrictions. Hundreds of major Israeli chains are still on strike, and now both landlords and the government are fighting back. Israeli businesses are mostly now allowed to return to work, but it's day two of the general strike, started by over 200 large companies operating in Israel. And the government wants answers. After over a month with closed doors due to COVID-19, these companies on strike say they feel cheated by the government. And they're now demanding compensation for lost revenue, similar to those being issued to small businesses and the self-employed. Critics, however, accuse these companies of holding their employees hostage, most of whom are desperately waiting to return to work. And now marketplace landlords and the Israeli Competition Authority are fighting to stop the strike. For one, CEO Chai Galias, who manages 22 open-air shopping centers, is demanding that his marketplaces be opened after Independence Day. And he argues that his tenants have no right to stay closed. The Israeli Competition Authority, on the other hand, is opening a probe into the Association of Fashion and Commerce Chains, which is organizing the strike. The authority says the coordinated closure may constitute breaches of competition laws. 
Now, this is a big question. Who is to blame for the coronavirus pandemic? Well, China is largely taking the heat for the spread of the virus, and now governments and private businesses are taking aim at the Chinese administration in an effort to get them to cover the cost. Joining us with the details is founder and president of the Jerusalem Washington Center, Gideon Israel. So we know that in the U.S. and in Israel, there are several lawsuits that are being filed, but what other actions are being taken against the Chinese government? Well, as you mentioned, that there are, there are lawsuits um, right now. There's a lawsuit uh, from a, with a Florida law firm that's uh, suing China for something like, um, I think, three or six trillion dollars uh, based on the damages. But some of the actions that um, the United States has been taking, there, there's a bill in the in the Senate uh, introduced uh, introduced by uh, um, the Republican Tom Cotton that would um, require federal entities to start purchasing um, uh, various uh, pharma products and other uh, essential medical products from U.S. companies and gra gradually remove the supply chain back to the United States. Mm -hmm. um, another senator has said that, that China should um, um, forgive the United States more than a trillion dollar debt because of the damage that they've caused the United States. We've seen that a, a German newspaper um, actually sent a $1 billion uh, or, or even more bill to, uh, to China's president for, for the damages that, um, that they've caused to uh, But what about here in so, Israel? Are we seeing Israelis take any actions? So we, we haven't, there hasn't been anything reported, but um, Isra Israel certainly has to tread a fine line between um, the United States and China. Israel's obviously, there's a lot of uh, Chinese... In investment in, in, in Israeli, um, Israeli uh, uh, technology companies. But China also has a lot of uh, investments in um, Israeli infrastructure projects mm -hmm. that have wor worried the United States, um, both uh, investments in the Ashdod port, and um, China is set to um, manage the Haifa port already in, in 2021. Right, which and many people are very upset about. They don't think that that's what should be happening. I mean, my question for you is, what effects do you think that this is going to have on China in the long term if we're seeing so many different countries, so many different groups coming out against the government? Well, the, 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 the effects in the long term is that, that countries uh, might have to say that we're willing to pay a little more for, for some of the products the essential products that our, our countries need mm -hmm. in order not to be dependent on China. Uh, we saw that uh, Japan allocated more than $2 billion of its uh, stimulus plan to um, encourage companies is, uh, to come back to, to Japan. And there was... What? Continue. And, and, there, was, and there was a... There was a uh, there's a company that's producing masks, masks that's been one of the first companies to to start moving its supply chain, supply, supply chain uh, back to back to Japan, but but I think going going back to Israel, um, the the U.S. expressed a lot of worry that that China was going to be uh, managing the Haifa port. Mm -hmm. In fact, some said that the decision was made in the transportation ministry without um, conducting the National Security Council at all. And um, interestingly enough, only a few days ago, uh, Jacob Nagel, who was the former uh, national security uh, advisor to the prime minister, actually wrote an op-ed in the Jerusalem Post about um, that being, uh, you know, a very serious mm -hmm. problem. Right. So, so um, cer certainly a lot of a lot of countries are looking to move products back, at, back to back to their their countries. Mm -hmm. And um, on, on the other hand, they want China to to pay up for the damages that they've caused to the world economy. Well, I think the question is whether or not China will actually do that and, and how, you know, the world even goes about, you know, dealing with lawsuits like this because it's so international. Uh, it's going to be very interesting to see how this plays out. Again, thank you so much for joining us, Gideon. Now, amidst the coronavirus craziness, there is something good happening. It seems that the deadly novel virus is bringing people together in Israel, Figur figuratively, of course. A new poll has just been released, revealing that Israelis feel a higher sense of belonging to the state of Israel than ever before. Do you feel like you're an integral part of your country and share a common destiny with other locals? Here in Israel, the answer to that question is almost a resounding yes. 90% of Israelis say they feel a higher sense of belonging to their country. 
It's the highest figure recorded in a decade in the annual survey by the Israel Democracy Institute. The figures increased from last year among all of Israel's subpopulations, from the ultra-Orthodox Jews to the Arab Israelis. And of the Jewish Israelis surveyed, 92.5% say they feel like an integral part of the state. And 77% of Arab Israelis say the same. To put that change into perspective, just last year, only 45% of Arab Israeli respondents said that they feel like they're an integral part of the state. The survey has also found that more than 63% of the population believes that Israel has generally had more successes than failures since its establishment. Now, these are super, super interesting results, especially when you think about how politically divided Israel has been for the last year and a half with three back-to-back -back elections. Uh, but it is clear that coronavirus has changed the public perception. I'm actually interested to see uh, what next year's numbers look like. Now, this devastating story has shaken up Israel. The owner of a shop in Jerusalem's popular Machne Yehuda market has died. According to reports, he took his own life less than two weeks ago because of his financial issues that were caused by the coronavirus lockdowns. But he's far from the only one facing economic ruin. And joining us now to talk about suicide amidst this terrible crisis is Dr. Shiri Daniels, executive director of counseling at Iran, an Israeli organization for emotional first aid. So how have you been noticing a spike in calls from people with severe depression or suicidal thoughts? Well, here at Iran's hotline and hot online service, we are experiencing a dramatic rise in calls from 500 a day in routine to over 1,400 calls daily. People share with us their feelings of anxiety and stress, as well as feeling lonely while separated from people and roles that comfort them. There are some people who deal with uh, severe mental distress and they mm -hmm. talk about depression, suicidal thoughts, as well as a sense of hopelessness. Is, they are at risk. Is um, finance the I, primary cause here? Well, yeah, fi finance can be a stressful situation that can trigger crisis and uh, risk. But in addition to personal traits, mental illness and a lack of social support, so, so when you, I mean, I guess this might seem like you've already answered, but what kinds of people are most likely to call in? Is it people who have pre-existing conditions? Or are many of these people just being triggered by the, the, the current situation that we're seeing right now? Well, actually, everyone. We get calls from men and women at all ages, youth and soldiers, parents and the elderly, uh, people who speak uh, Hebrew or English or Russian, Amharic, Arabic, uh, we uh, They are answered by uh, over 1,300 volunteers and staff members mm -hmm. in Israel and in North America. Uh, actually, we all share the same reality and are all in this together. So what are your emergency protocols when you're dealing with something like this? And have you been able to prevent any situations from escalating into something much worse? Well, first of all, we listen to the callers without judgment. Sometimes just listening can save uh, lives. Uh, when we uh, have suicidal calls, uh, we conduct an initial uh, d um, test to see that uh, if the risk is uh, immediate. Mm -hmm. And when it is so, uh, we activate emergency protocols and contact emergency forces in order to prevent suicide and save lives. And we actually activate this protocol three to four times a day and saves hundreds of lives each year. Sitting in the chair that you're sitting in, dealing with all these people and hearing, you know, um, these concerns, does it make you feel that the lockdowns that we're seeing right now are right? Are we going to see more people injured in this situation because of financial ruin or, you know, mental stress from being stuck at home than actually from the coronavirus itself? Well, we have to remember that uh, the lockdown can uh, protect us uh, health-wise, but loneliness has its toll. And lonely loneliness can be deadly. And we know after similar situations in the past uh, in crisis that uh, after uh, the crisis has been taken care of, the emotional applications, uh, implications continue for years, mm -hmm. mainly on uh, mental health and uh, also a uh, rise in suicide. All right. And, and has there been a spike in suicide itself, not just obviously calls that you guys are receiving? 
Well, in the uh, previous states of emergency, we usually see a decline in suicidal calls mm -hmm. because people are occupied with the external threat and not in their inner uh, world and feelings. Right. But we don't see that. We don't see that in the, this coronavirus uh, crisis, sadly. Actually, what right. we see in Iran uh, is a rise in uh, suicidal calls. And uh, we see that people are uh, in extreme risk these days. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us and updating us. It's important for those who might be having these thoughts to understand that you're not alone. Take care. Well, thank you. It's important also to know that even difficult situations have more than one solution. And mm -hmm. uh, you are not alone. Reach out for help. It makes all the difference. Thank you. All right. Now, Israeli Memorial Day has just begun at sundown today. But, of course, government restrictions over COVID-19 have made normal traditions and ceremonies impossible, like the main tradition of visiting the graves of fallen soldiers. There are 53 military cemeteries in Israel, and every year on Memorial Day, they become the most densely visited sites across the country. So this year, with lockdowns over the coronavirus just starting to lift, the health ministry has barred families from cemeteries on the day itself. Instead, families have been encouraged to visit in small groups over days leading up to Memorial Day. And that's not all. Travel between cities in general has been barred on Yom Zikaron and Yom Atzimut, or Memorial Day and Independence Day, respectively. So for the next two days, prepare for evening lockdowns similar to those imposed over Passover. That said, Defense Minister Naftali Bennett said that he would not stop the bereaved with any force. Meanwhile, the annual Memorial Day events and ceremonies conducted at the Western Wall in Jerusalem and at the Mount Herzl National Cemetery are being held without public participation. Most have even been pre-recorded, and all major public ceremonies have been moved online or to TV. Still, a fighter jet flyover during the memorial will be included, and earlier in the day, test flights could be seen above Jerusalem and in Tel Aviv. Also, the annual two-minute sirens, which ring out across the country denoting a moment of silence, are still scheduled for tonight at the start of Memorial Day and at 11 a.m. tomorrow. And then, of course, there will still be two reading of the names ceremonies, one for fallen soldiers and another for victims of terror. 76 names have been added this year, including active and retired veterans and terror victim Rena Schnurr. So like we said, Memorial Day in Israel this year is really unlike anything that we've ever known. Because of the coronavirus pandemic, we can't be together with the bereaved and we're urged not to visit cemeteries. And that's why National Service volunteers have set up a new platform where bereaved families can tell stories about their loved ones who passed away during military service. Joining us with more on the Connect to Care project is National Service volunteer Shalva Eisenberg. So what exactly is the Connect to Care Our Brothers project and how did it come about? Uh -huh. So Connect to Care is a platform for bereaved families to virtually share the stories of their loved ones and for others to join these conversations and participate, um, participate, show, um, be able to provide some comfort to these families on this very difficult day. So how do conversations actually take place? How does this work? Um, what happens is uh, whoever wants to join a conversation goes to our website, connecttocare.ourbrothers.co.il, and there you can either join a meeting or initiate a meeting. And when you join a meeting, you essentially just choose a meeting that you are interested in, mm -hmm. and the meetings are conducted through Zoom, so you'll be notified accordingly. Now, what does it take to register as a conversation manager or a participant? I mean, what do you have to, I guess have gone through? Well, fam uh, family members, friends, people who have loved ones who passed away, who were victims of terror or fallen soldiers and want to share this story and um, really want to express this on Memorial Day, mm -hmm. um, decide to initiate a meeting and they write the information on the website and it's sent out, and whoever wants to is welcome to join the conversation that will take place when Amazing. they schedule it. So, so how many people have uh, signed up for the project so far? As of now, there are around 1,120 wow. conversations and around 65,000 participants in these conversations. That's amazing. And I mean, is this also a platform in which people who are not necessarily Israeli can join to kind of understand how Israel uh, 
you know, rem commemorates Israeli Memorial Day? Because, you know, as somebody who immigrated to this country, I know how special it is. Mm -hmm. Of course. Uh, this platform uh, is open to people from all over the world. There are some conversations being taken place in, in English as well. And it's very, it's very important to share this opportunity with people from all over the world because it really is a special and important day in Israel. Now, have you received any special responses so far? You know, anybody who's been particularly impacted by taking part in these meetings? Uh, yeah, we actually received a lot of very appreciative responses. We've had mothers, fathers, friends, siblings who've contacted us mentioning that they were worried that they'll feel very sad and lonely on Memorial Day because usually uh, people from all across Israel go out and show appreciation and comfort to the bereaved mm -hmm. families. But because of the restrictions, they won't be able to do that and they won't feel the comfort that they usually feel on this difficult day. Right. And because of this project, they now have the opportunity to feel comfort not only from the people who they love, but from strangers from all over Israel and all over the world to join them and show some cons uh, consolation. Oh, it's absolutely beautiful what you guys are doing. I'm going to check it out myself. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. And just, just one last question. When is it going to be active? When can people join in? This is already active. People okay. who initiate meetings that have been initiating them from last night till um, Memorial Day itself on Wednesday. Okay. And um, you can join a meeting at any point until the meeting actually happens. Perfect. All right. Again, thank you so much for joining us. Sure. Thank you. All right. Now, one Memorial Day project this year is really, really standing out to me. Each year, the Jewish cultural hub Beit Avichai in Jerusalem brings together animators with bereaved families so that together they can turn stories of remembrance about their fallen sons and daughters into animation films. So these animators essentially transform memories from the lives of IDF soldiers into beautiful little movies. And this year, they're more important than ever, since many bereaved families won't be able to visit the grave sites of their loved ones. To end today's show, we wanted to show you just one of these heart-wrenching pieces of art. What you're about to see is part of the short film, The Music of His Life. It's the story of Tzachi, who from the age of six was a gifted musician. And when he served as a combat soldier during the Israeli occupation of southern Lebanon in 2000, he would play music for children in northern Israel, many of which would spend days stuck in bomb shelters. And one Friday, when his mother tried to call his cell phone, he didn't answer. So she left him a voice message with one of his favorite songs playing on the radio. It turned out that that song was actually recorded exactly at the moment of his death. Now, as saddening as these video animations are, they're so important in remembering the lives and stories of Israel's fallen soldiers. Almost every Israeli is required to go into the military here, so Memorial Day truly affects everyone, and I hope that you all have a peaceful evening. Now, on that note, let's take a look at the weather forecast. Tonight should be partly cloudy and cool with lows of around 56 or 14 degrees Celsius. Then tomorrow, we can expect a sunny and warm Memorial Day with highs of nearly 80 Fahrenheit or 27 degrees Celsius. 
All right, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.51 shekels to the American dollar. For more news from ILTV, please like ILTV on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube and Roku TV pages. I'm Natasha Kirchek, and thanks so much for watching.